Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. We're your hosts, Dr. Jess Dyer and Dr. Andrea Love. And this week, we are tackling a topic that already has, has my mouth watering, <laughs> sushi. So before we get into it, we have lots to say about sushi. Um, just a reminder, if you haven't already tuned into last week's episode, we... We touched, well, no, we touched, we did a deep dive on a topic that many people warned us to steer clear of, um, the use of animals in research, um, particularly in preclinical research. Um, and so if you haven't checked that out, I think we did, I'd like to say we did a really good job, Andrea, a very balanced conversation and tackled it very comprehensively. We both participated um, in animal research. It's something that we have, you know. Insider, not I don't anymore. Um, but uh, but yeah, so definitely go back and check that out if you haven't already. Andrea, sushi. How do we feel about sushi? I love it, and it's funny because um, I'm gonna I'm gonna call out Jesse O'Shea, who if anybody is on Instagram, he is a MD, infectious disease specialist down in Atlanta. I was down in Atlanta. Um, like a month ago for a shoe photo shoot, but we got to, we got together for dinner and we went to an oyster bar and he picked the restaurant and I was like, Oh, so we're going to get oysters. And he was like, Oh no, I don't, I don't eat raw oysters because of the potential pathogens. And I was like, and I, and we talked about it and I was like, you know what? It's funny. Cause in microbiology, um, you get either one or the other, you get the germaphobes who are like, well, I know what all the pathogens are and I know where they exist and I try to be very risk averse. And then you get the others who are like 99.9% .9 of bacteria and microorganisms are harmless. And so I'm going to live life on the edge. And I'm definitely that one. And he's definitely the other. And I did get him to eat one raw oyster, uh, maybe two. And he told me he was going to yell at me if he ended up getting food poisoning. But <laughs> Thankfully, it was all good. But yeah, I love sushi. Um, I often when I'm traveling for work, I, you know, use that as my per diem meal, I'm gonna get sushi because oh. I get enough of it. Yeah. Sushi is my all time favorite thing. Like I just I go crazy for sushi in particular yellowtail. I am just crazy for yellowtail scallion avocado. Wow. Favorite flavor combination. What about you? I was going to say my favorite is salmon roe or ikura, which mm. are the eggs, the salmon eggs. And I also do love um, salmon, um, the salmon meat. Um, and then uni. I love sea urchin. And that's really love sometimes hard to find and pricey. And it's very yeah. ocean, ocean flavored, but I love yes. it. Yes. Definitely not for everyone. No. Um, and I, I know we're going to get into this, but have you ever had food poisoning from so, fish? So hard to know possibly i don't know if i could pin it down definitively um to fish but you know i've had suspected food poisoning a couple of times throughout life um definitely not nearly as bad as the norovirus that i got in december from my niece that was the worst stomach bug i've ever had yeah you were out of commission oh, for a little bit um i'm not gonna share details here but it was not it got good. graphic it got graphic yeah. Um, so real quick, I have for sure been sick. Well, three times in my life for sure from, from seafood. So first was from, um, mussels when I was very young and it took me years to go back to eating mussels. Um, and I love them. And then second was from oysters actually on the day that I defended my dissertation and got my dogs, right? That story. You guys were out celebrating, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was wild. And then the third, which is most relevant to this conversation and I'll save it. I have details, um, had to do with a, a poke bowl where I was eating, um, raw tuna and, and other goodies. Uh, but we'll get into that in a little bit. So let's set the stage for the origins of sushi. So I, I just assumed it had originated in Japan, but I guess originally um, it was actually originated in China. So a fourth century Chinese dictionary mentions salted fish being placed in cooked rice, causing it to undergo a fermentation process. 
And so some people think that this is the first time that the concept of sushi appeared, at least in print. Um, and then the process of using fermented rice as a fish preservative originated in Southeast Asia several centuries ago. Um, and then when rice begins to ferment, lactic acid bacilli are produced. Andrew, you might need to translate that for us. And then the acid along with salt causes a reaction that slows bacterial growth in fish. And this process is sometimes referred to as pickling. And it's the reason why, and you probably can pronounce this better than I can, Andrea, but why the sushi kitchen is called a sukeba. Sukeba. Okay. Or pickling place. That's what it translates to. Um, and then the concept of sushi was likely introduced in Japan, uh, excuse me, to Japan in the ninth century and became popular there as Buddhism spread. Um, the Buddhist dietary practice of abstaining from meat meant that many Japanese people turned to fish as a dietary staple. And so the Japanese are credited with first preparing sushi as a complete dish, eating the fermented rice together with the preserved fish. Um, and this combination is known as narazushi. I, I, I really yeah, yeah. okay, or or aged sushi. Yeah, and so like in in you know obviously white people have often co opted popular trends, including food. But um, you know in the U.S. we often hear. Um, like sushi or nigiri versus sashimi. So yeah. traditionally nigiri or sushi is a, a piece of raw fish on a little ball of rice. Um, sashimi is just the slices or the presentation of the fish itself. And then of course you have the maki, maki sushi, which are the rolls. Mm -hmm. um, so there's different ways to actually prepare it to be eaten as as a meal, you also have chirashi, which is um, a bowl of rice with the, the fish arranged on top of it. Um, but ultimately, you know, we hear a lot about sushi grade or sashimi grade fish, which is really kind of the topic that we want to talk about. And, you know, what does it mean or what are the implications of that? Absolutely. I hear it all the time, you know, oh, but it's sushi grade. So we're going to get into what it actually means and what it doesn't mean. But let's just set the stage a little bit um, for sushi in the U.S. So this is a booming industry. Um, it's currently estimated to be um, about $27.5 billion industry in the U.S. And it's expected to grow by about $2.5 billion by the year 2025. Um, I will say that when I was researching sort of the, the industry, it seems like prices are going up. Um, there, uh, you know, people are starting to acknowledge the realities of overfishing um, as well as climate change. And so the cost of sushi could go up. The supply of sushi may change in the future. Um, and in fact, more than one third of the planet's fish stocks are being caught at biologically unsustainable levels. This is according to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. And illegal, unreported, and unregulated seafood accounted for around $2.4 billion in U.S. imports in 2019. And this is according to the U.S. ITC. And there's, and because of this, of course, we know that um, especially the marine ecosystems are on the brink of what we call a trophic collapse, where basically the food pyramid is at risk of collapsing. So larger organisms in the ocean rely on, um, you know, algae and zooplankton and krill and things like that to survive and feed, you know, higher chains. And so if we're overfishing some of these intermediate um, levels of the food pyramid, that's going to impact larger animals seabirds, really everything. And so there are some measures being taken to be more sustainable. Um, you know, farm, farm or fishery rage fish um, can often be more environmentally sustainable. Um, also a little bit more controlled when we talk about potential contaminants, which we'll get into soon. Um, but also, you know, there is a lot of, of, measures that need to be taken on a global scale to address some of these things. But something about these these illegal, unreported and unregulated seafood is also important. When we talk about the public health, because if we're there was a recent study that talked about how a lot of fish were being mislabeled to upcharge or mislead consumers. And when we talk about potential contaminants and proper storage of sushi or, or even fish meant to be cooked, mislabeling them as one species when they're actually a different species also has a potential public health uh, risk. 
Mm -hmm. So Andrea, um, I don't know if you, if you tell me that what you think makes the most sense here, but should we talk about parasites and bacteria or should we maybe take a step back and just talk about FDA regulation or lack thereof? What do you, what do you yeah, think? Maybe, maybe let's talk about the regulations on fish first and then we can kind of dig into some of the potential risks. Sure, sure. Um, so I'll just um, kick it off and then maybe you can get into some of the details. Um, so there's no national governing body that regulates um, or grades the preparation of fish um, that are destined to be eaten raw or cooked like there is for beef, right, where we have the USDA. And so we know, you know, the FDA has sketched out, they've created these advisory guidelines um, that lay out processes for handling a variety of fish meant for raw consumption, but they are not intended to determine the quality of fish. So Andrew, do you want to fill in some of the details? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, FDA has these guidelines, they talk about um, different types of fish, different species of fish, whether they're wild caught or, or farmed in aquaculture. Um, but the issue is, is that these are solely guidelines. There is no federal law that regulates um, the, the catching, the um, preparation, the storage, etc. And so, um, and in addition, these um, these regulations aren't aren't related to the quality of the fish product itself, like we often see with like the marbling of the fat and different types of beef and how they're certified. It is related to the relative safety, so so that's good. Um, but if, unfortunately, this is not enforced by law. So different states have different types of regulations. So if you have questions about your own state regulations, you want to look up typically their Department of Health or your state U.S. Uh, U.S sorry, your State Department of Agriculture. So typically when you're saying this is sushi grade and this is sash or sashimi grade fish, this kind of is just a marketing term. So it was created once upon a time to kind of improve market access for fish destined to be used um, at sushi restaurants. And um, generally speaking, there is a decent amount of adherence to the FDA guidelines, but ultimately because this is not enforced at different fisheries, fish markets, or even restaurants, it comes down to how much you personally trust where you're getting your fish from. Um, for example, though, there are some states that have put this into law. So for example, um, both in New York City and New York State, the New York City Department of Health, um, which regulates all New York City restaurants, and the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, which regulates fish markets across the state, actually have turned those FDA guidelines into law for the preparation, storage, transport, et cetera, of raw fish. Um, but this is, again, going to vary state by state. So the FDA guidelines really focus on um, how to properly butcher fish, so gutting, filleting, cleaning, etc. And that's to reduce and limit bacterial contamination of the fish, typically after it's caught. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it. There are some bacterial pathogens that can contaminate fish in the wild, but a lot of the risk for foodborne bacterial illness in fish is related to improper handling and improper storage. But the FDA also includes tips for limiting and killing of parasites. And here, parasites really refer to worms in the fish. So almost all freshwater fish contain worms of, of certain types, often tapeworms, which in the case of fish, these are fish tapeworms. Um, but a lot of marine fish can as well. Um, if you look at the FDA document, which is quite extensive, um, this includes a lot of your common fish, fluke, flounder, sole, mackerel, tilapia, monkfish, salmon, etc. Um, there are also pathogen risks for shellfish. Um, a lot of these relate to a particular bacteria called Vibrio vulnificus, which can infect um, shellfish, uh, other fish as well, and that is found in, in marine environments. Um, but typically with regard to killing parasites, which are these worms that we're talking about, there are kind of three broad classes of worms. There are the, the roundworms, which are nematodes. Um, and we'll talk about uh, one class of these that are of particular concern in the context of fish. There are tapeworms and here we're talking about fish tapeworms. And then there are also what we call flukes. Um, and so these ultimately can actually be killed by freezing fish. And so a lot of times if you're talking about sushi grade or sashimi grade fish, um, these vendors are often using this to say that, okay, we flash frozen or deep frozen our fish at certain criteria. 
So Andrea, I just really want to underscore what you just said, because I, I don't think that the majority of people realize that sushi grade, it's subjective and it really is used as a, as a, as a marketing term. Um, and it really depends on whether the, the vendor, um, deems the fish of the, you know, of quality to, to be eaten raw. Right. And so in that sense, it is totally subjective. Yes. So j just to get into a little bit, and there's a, there's a lot, you know, we'll share the link to the FDA site. Um, but again, there are no guidelines. There are no regulations to determine if fish is sushi grade, but the regulations pertain to proper handling procedures of fish meant for raw consumption. So as Andrea said, it has a lot to do with temperature. So freezing and storing at an ambient temperature of negative four degrees Fahrenheit or below for seven days total time, or freezing at an ambient temp temperature of negative 31 degrees Fahrenheit or below until solid and storing at an ambient temperature. Um, yep, not yeah, same temperature. temperature. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and so all of this is, you know, it's it's um, intended to kill parasites, as Andrea just said. So, um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so I think the big takeaway here is the colder the freezer, the shorter the duration that you can freeze it to kill parasites and then ultimately store your fish. So a lot of these fish markets, vendors, and restaurants have what we call a deep freezer. So those will get down to this minus 31 Fahrenheit or minus 35 Celsius. So if you freeze it there until it's a solid piece and then you store it up to 15 hours, that typically will kill any parasites. If you have not as powerful a freezer, you have to freeze it at a slightly warmer fr freezing temperature, but you have to keep it there for longer until the parasites are potentially killed. Well, and you also said before, and it's really important to note, like it, it really depends on the timing. You know, this has to happen as soon as the fish is on the boat, right? They must be caught fast, bled, and then gutted upon capture and then frozen in a flash freezer within eight hours of leaving the water. Yes. And there are obviously a lot of steps <laughs> and, and involved also, in that. You know, it's really important. So, you know, I mentioned that I really like salmon roe, which is the eggs of the salmon. So Eggs in and of themselves are often not contaminated with the parasites, but the egg casing can. So if you're looking for eggs to be used for sushi, they have to be rinsed and removed from the casing um, within a certain period of time to ensure that they haven't been contaminated by any parasites in the casing. Um, and it's also it also depends on the parasite in question. So as I mentioned, like most animals broadly in the wild have some sort of parasite, you know, wild, wild coyotes and wolves and things like that. They often have, have tapeworms, fish, very similar. There are things in the wild. Um, you know, so when we look at the, the FDA regulations and the suggestions, there are certain things that are exempted from these guidelines. Very specific big species of wild tuna, such as big eye yellowfin and bluefin, um, they are excluded from this freezing guideline because um, the reason for it is because there's no epidemiological data that eating those raw lead to a public health burden, but a lot of the other fish species and smaller species of tuna would still fall under the requirement or the recommendation to be frozen. Um, wild salmon is almost always contaminated. Um, even farm-raised salmon can be unless they are certified that the feed that the salmon have been raised on is parasite-free, then they would be exempt. Um, but this is one reason why you typically can't go buy like a regular piece of fish from Wegmans and say, I'm going to freeze it myself in my freezer and then it's going to be safe because your freezer at home is not going to get cold enough to kill some of these parasites. So, you know, as I mentioned, there are three kind of broad, broad classes of, of worm parasites that we think about, um, tapeworms, roundworms, and flukes. Tapeworms are usually the easiest to kill. They're the most susceptible to freezing. Then roundworms, which are a little bit more robust, and then flukes are even the most resistant. And so often when we're talking about this, like we want to try and kill everything because we want this fish ultimately to be safe to consume. So I want to move on and sort of give people some tips. I mean, some some signs that fish might not be safe for consumption. Um, anything to add before we get to that? And I yes. know. Yeah. So okay. I wanted to also yeah. say, um, you know, another thing I know Jess mentioned this idea of the pickling of the fish. And so there's a, a bit of a misconception that, well, if you cure your fish in acid like ceviche, that is fine because acid can inhibit 
certain pathogens and things like that. And, and while it may work for some bacteria or prevent spoilage, um, acid pickling or acid curing actually does not kill um, uh, the roundworms that we're going to talk more about. So again, really the biggest thing to ensure that the fish is friendly to be eaten raw or as most friendly as possible is, is temperature based. It's freezing at a deep temperature. Andrea, I'm chuckling over here because we're talking about all these things, but like, I still want to go get sushi. Oh, 100%. Right? Like I would, <laughs> I, I may get it for dinner tonight. I think that's going to happen. Um, all right. So there are some obvious signs that fish might not be safe cons for consumption, but it's not always that obvious, um, obviously. So um, for sure, you know, you want to look at the, um, the texture of the fish, you know, if it's not firm, if it's super mushy, that's not a great sign. Um, also, if it has an overly fishy smell, and this can sometimes be difficult for people to, um, you know, to discern because obviously certain fish smell fishier than others. So it's just like, does it have a stronger fishy smell than usual? Right. Um, but like mackerel is super fishy and I love right. that about mackerel, but it's supposed to smell that way because it's an oily fish. Right. Um, and if you happen to have the whole fish there, you know, and you're going to be the one who's slicing it, um, then you obviously want to check to see, does the fish have bright eyes? Is the, you know, does the body show no obvious signs of bruising or discoloration or any other obvious damage? Um, Andrea, did you want to talk about like worms and fish? Yeah, How sometimes, so, yeah. so some of these worms, and actually, um, maybe this is a good, a good opportunity to just quickly touch on this before we get into some of the parasites of interest. But um, so the reason that these parasites are a concern for when we're eating fish is because of the life cycle. So typically these parasites, and here I'm talking about worms, we'll talk more about bacterial contamination and some of the other potential things to be aware of. But um, these these parasites have a multi-stage life cycle. So they have a larval stage, they have an adult stage. Um, the adult stage is kind of where they take up resident in their end host. Um, and then the the adults secrete eggs and then and then they complete the life cycle again. So the larvae normally live in the gut of the fish because they're just waiting to be eaten by something um, because the goal of a parasite is to complete their life cycle. And so typically what's going to happen is um, it's going to depend on the parasite in question. I'll talk a little bit about that, but parasites want to seek their end host organism to complete their life cycle. In the case of fish tapeworms, these are fish eating mammals, land mammals, usually like bears and otters. If we're talking about the roundworms, which are the Anasakis genus, genus, these are going to be marine mammals. So whales, seals, dolphins. Um, and so basically what happens is they just live in the gut of the fish, they're eaten, and when they're eaten in the mammal that they're destined to live in, that larval stage will start to develop into the adult, and then they will complete their life cycle, essentially, and they will take up residence in that mammal. What happens when we are fishing for them is we pull them out of the water and we interrupt the parasite life cycle. So the fish's body temperature immediately starts to rise because now they've been pulled out of the cold ocean or, or fresh water. And what that, what, that, what that triggers is the larva of the parasite starts to burrow out of the gut into the meat of the fish or the flesh of the fish. And that's why we then can find those worms in the meat of the fish. So that's really why it's also super important to gut your fish almost immediately or fillet it. You have to keep it cold because any larva that's that's in the fish gut will, will stay there as long as the temperature stays low. Um, and so that's why it's really important to process fish carefully. Um, now, when we're talking about these different types of worms, the round worms are of most concern because the um, end cycle, the end host are these marine mammals, which live in a cold environment. And it's very different physiologically from a human mammal. And so what often happens is those, um, those roundworms often try to leave our GI tract if we eat them in a contaminated fish. And we'll talk more about that later. Whereas the tapeworms, they live in a mammal that's more similar to us that lives on land like a bear. And so it's often causes less severe disease and is more easy to treat. Um, but that's why it's something that we always want to factor in. And sometimes you can see visible worms in fish. Um, it's normal. That's, that's what happens. Um, and, and cooking fish is obviously, you know, best practice to kill those guys. Two things. 
one, the animal rights people are coming for us <laughs> after last week's episode. And now we're talking about gutting fish and all kinds. All right. Anyway, that was one. Two, this makes me think about, and I, I, I know we wanted to talk about this, the case of the guy who had this massive worm. Um, I know it made national news, you know, everyone was talking about it. he ate sushi and then he had this, I don't know, it was like several feet long or something worm inside of his gut. And I, and that, and you, please, you know, you'll maybe can explain what was likely going on there and then what he was sick with. Um, but I think that that has sort of been taken and now people just assume like, oh, if you eat sushi, our body is just riddled with worms, riddled with parasites. And now people are promoting the parasite cleanse, which went viral on TikTok. We've talked about this. We've done reels. We've done pod episodes. We've done posts. And, you know, the bottom line is if typically if you have a parasite, you're going to know it. There are going to be some clinical signs and symptoms um, in most cases. Well, the parasite cleanse that most people are, are consuming, it's just basically making you poop a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's not like, doing anything it's other like than that. Laxative. It's not, you know, it, and we'll talk about treatment, but, but depending on the parasite in question, you need specific classes of medication. So if we're talking about worm parasites, you need anti-helminth treatments to kill right. the worms. If we're talking about bacteria, you need antibiotics. You know, you're not going to take a laxative and just get rid of worms that are in your gut. And, and we'll talk about some of the, the epidemiology, but these are not super common. Yes, the prevalence can increase in certain countries um, or as climate change is accelerating, um, where we are seeing increased rates of things like vibriosis, which is caused by a bacterial pathogen because of the warming waters. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's not something that you're going to treat with these TikTok parasite cleanses. Right. So don't do those cleanses, please. If you think you have a parasite, go go to the doctor. Um, all right. So can I, unless you had something else to say, I wanted to sort of share my experience. Yeah, let's talk about let's talk about this one first because it's kind of unique. Um, and um, then we can get into some of the other ones. So I'm going to get to the punchline, which is that I was sick with something called scombroid fish poisoning, which is also known as histamine fish poisoning, which I did not know about until three years ago when I got hit like a freight train. <laughs> Let me paint a picture. Um, I was at a bar. Oh, no. Well, okay. I went to this restaurant festival thing with my husband, Ethan, and with his brother, and we were eating poke bowls, which, I, and Andrew, you probably know better what I do but, than I do, but just cubes of raw fish with some, typically with rice, sesame seeds, some other like fixins. And I had tuna and I forget what other fish was in there. And I remember as I was eating it, I made a comment like, hmm, this tastes kind of peppery. And I just assumed wrong, wrongly that what I was tasting was something like wasabi or something that was added to the bowl. Wrong. Um, all right. So scombroid, and then I'll get into how this uh, manifested for me, but it resembles an allergic reaction. It occurs within minutes to hours of eating fish contaminated with histamine. It is one of the top four most common seafood borne illnesses. And let me share with you the symptoms that I experienced. So about 30 minutes after eating my poke bowl, which tasted a little peppery, we decided to go to a brewery. All of a sudden we're sitting there, Andrea, I got so hot. And yes, we were in South Florida at the time. This was like depths of hell hot. Like my whole body got red. I felt like I was on fire and I ran to the bathroom. I feel I'm so sorry for anyone who entered that bathroom with hours after it was in there. The most horrific diarrhea. It was like my guts liquefied. I couldn't get off the floor. I thought I didn't. I thought that this was it. I was dying. So I come out and I'm telling Ethan, who's, you know, he's had a few beers. He's having a good time. And he's like, oh, my God, you have scombroid. Um, he's an ER doc. He noticed it right away. He's like, we have to get you home and we have to get some antihistamine in you. You know, we have to sort of treat your symptoms right now. There's really nothing more to do. Um, well, and the yeah. really interesting thing is that this is it's it is a food contamination. But what's actually happening is the bacteria are causing the release of histamines from the cells of the fish and so now it's freely available so that when you eat it you're now eating all these histamines and as you know when we talk about allergies histamines mediate those allergic reaction symptoms and histamine is 
a protein. It's not a, a, an actual organism. So even if you have a histamine contaminated fish cooking, it doesn't actually cure it. It doesn't get and, rid of it. Andrea, we were 40 minutes from our house. I, that car ride, no. I, I, all windows, everything was open. And I, honest to God, contemplated sticking my butt out the window. There was no other way to deal with it. It was, it was really horrific. Um, but all right. So what is this? And I don't know how to pronounce. Well, actually, no, before I pronounce the word that I can't pronounce, um, which I'm highlighting for you in our outline. Oh, is, scombridae. Yeah. So that's why okay. it's called scombroid poison. Cause it's the, the family of fish are in the scombridae family. Um, so it's like your, your big fish often skipjack, bonito, tuna, mac mackerel um you know but it can it can be you know it can occur in other fish species as well so the common symptoms and i was lucky enough to experience all of them um were are rash diarrhea reddening or flushing of the face sometimes the neck arms and upper part of the body sweating headache and vomiting all of the above i think i took two benadryl i was out for like 24 hours and then i felt fine but it all comes down to the way that the fish are are stored Perfect. In this case, right? Perfect. So it's if they're not properly refrigerated, Absolutely. bacteria break down, and you, I, you'll please chime in with the details of this, but they break down the flesh of the fish, and then histamines are formed. And histamines, well, yeah. yeah. So so the histamines are released from the cells of the fish released. as they're degraded. Um, okay. You know, kind of like when we talked about the mast cells in a human allergic reaction. And so then you consume those histamines, um, which which lead to that allergic re reaction, essentially, because that's what histamines mediate all those symptoms, the redness and the flushing and the swelling and the, and the hotness and all that. And the tricky thing about this is you don't always, like, it doesn't necessarily appear that something is wrong with the fish. Um, sometimes, um, I guess, it, they, there can be a bad odor. In this case, there wasn't for me. Um, or a honeycombed appearance when cooked. Again, I was eating this raw. Um, but histamine-contaminated fish often have a metallic, sharp, or peppery taste. Um, okay, Andrea, did you and want to... And it, yeah. I also want to note, like, yeah, it's it's one of the top four kind of food poisoning related sea, seafood borne illnesses, but it's still not super common. Like we're talking about a few hundred cases, you know, per states, obviously more distributed towards like coastal states that have, you know, more fish heavy um, diets, but it really does relate to the improper storage of the fish um and not the fish in and of themselves um so it I was think hell in, in california they typically re report about 10 to 35 cases per year um but again generally speaking yes it's super unpleasant um it's it's often, but your treatment is going to relate to how you would treat an allergic reaction because that's what you're responding to is that histamine itself um yeah do you want to run through, I know we're sort of already kind of over the time, but there's so much we want to talk about other illnesses or. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, cool. um, so I talked a little bit about like why the parasites get into the meat in the first place. So two of the, um, worm related ones that are of concern for raw fish in particular are, um, anisaki genus worms, and they cause an anisakiasis, which is, um, also known as, so anything that's like iasis, it's like inflammation. That's what we're talking about. So it's the disease caused by the, the pathogen in question. Um, so anisakiasis is also caused herring worm disease. It's caused by eating the anisakis worms. Um, so these are nematode roundworms that are found in certain species of fish. As I mentioned, they live in the gut. Um, when the temperature of the fish increases, when they're pulled out of the water, those worms can often burrow into the meat of the fish. And then when you consume it, if it hasn't been flash frozen or frozen properly to kill those worms, uh, you can eat them and they can cause illness. So it's estimated that there's about 20,000 cases per year of anisakiasis. Um, these typically appear, the symptoms appear within a few hours of eating the fish. These typically cause... Um, vomiting, nausea, severe abdominal pain. Um, and these often, these worms can be found in, in the raw fish. It's about 90% of the cases occur in Japan. Um, it's not super common in the U.S., but it is increasing because of the popularity of sushi and sashimi. And again, the lack of regulation on the, the term sushi-grade fish. Um, and in some instances, as I mentioned, because our body is not the same as the marine mammals that are normally the end host for these worms. Um, sometimes these worms are looking for a better environment. And so what happens when we eat them is 
they can start to burrow into our intestinal walls looking for a more hospitable home. And in some rare instances, they may need surgery to resect the intestinal walls. Now, this is very rare, um, but it is why the Anasakis worms are a concern um, for humans. The next worm is the um, Diphilobothrium um, species or family of of worms. So these are called the fish tapeworms. So there are tapeworms in all sorts of species. The Tyenia um, tapeworms are often found in, in beef and pork. Um, so these particular worms, the fish tapeworms, these are actually the largest tapeworms that can infect people. They can grow up to 30 feet long. Again, not super common, um, but this is probably what that, that gentleman experienced. Um, they cause a disease called human diphilobothriasis. Again, it's just colonization by the diphilobothrium tapeworms. Um, and diagnosis typically is by finding eggs or segments of the worms in stool, um, very much like a cat tapeworm. Again, different species though. So with these tapeworms, they're actually more fragile. And so freezing fish at a lower temperature, even for a shorter period of time, um, actually is very effective at killing them. It's pretty uncommon. Um, but because a lot of these cases are actually asymptomatic, some people just don't know that they've been infected and, and ultimately, you know, they're you know, the tapeworms kind of exit the body. Um, symptoms can include things like abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, vomiting, um, um, uh, rapid weight loss or, or unexpected weight loss. Um, sometimes you can um, develop pernicious anemia because of destruction of the red blood cells because the parasite is literally, literally parasitizing your body. Um, and that can lead to B12 deficiency. In rare instances, um, you have little segments of the worm that migrate and that can lead to intestinal obstruction or um, gallbladder disease. But the good thing with um, these tapeworms is that they're very effectively treated by two different anti-helminths, which are called um, prosequantil and niclosamide. And they can really just flush out the worms very quickly. But again, this is not something you'd be doing the TikTok parasite cleanse, even if you're one of the, you know, estimated hundreds of cases per year. It is not as widespread as people are claiming. Um, there are other things, bacterial infections, usually from contamination of the fish during processing or preparation or storage. Um, so these can um, lead to a variety of symptoms. Um, often things like fever, diarrhea, um, so listeria, which we've talked about quite a bit. It's a bacteria um, that can infect pretty much anything, contaminate pretty much anything, raw food, vegetables, fish, dairy products. Um, it's about, you know, 1,600 people get listeria in the U.S. every year. Um, again, those symptoms are, are, you know, very stereotypical of your foodborne illness. So GI upset and so on. Um, there's also a, another type of um, toxin poisoning that we want to talk about very briefly. So that's ciguatera toxin. Again, this is um, typically from tropical or subtropical fish. And this, this illness is caused by the toxin that's produced as opposed to a pathogen itself. Um, and again, very rare, um, but again, this can lead to GI and potentially neurological symptoms. I want to quickly talk about um, Vibrio because Vibrio vulnificus is a bacteria that's found in the water, um, and this can infect um, shellfish and other fish. It's also related to the cholera bacteria, which is Vibrio cholerae, so they're in the same genus, um, and this accounts for about 80,000 foodborne or seafoodborne infections in the U.S. Um, and this is typically, again, contamination. So, um, you know, abdominal cramps, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever. Thankfully, this is caused by a bacteria, so we can treat this with antibiotics. Um, and then, of course, salmonella is another one that can contaminate um, fish, um, seafood, smoked seafood, et cetera. But again, a lot of these are not necessarily coming from the environment that the fish is from, per se, but more what we call temperature abuse, meaning that the fish is not stored properly, it's left at room temperature, and then it's re-refrigerated. And so that facilitates the growth of, growth of bacteria. And symptoms really vary um, based on the type of infection, right? And then the severity can really vary. It could be mild, it could be severe. You don't always need to seek medical attention. I mean, certainly if you're losing fluid because you're, you know, you have diarrhea or you're vomiting, you have to really focus on hydration. Um, this is also a, a very big reason why um, you're not supposed to eat sushi during pregnancy 
pregnancy. Um, and so um, I just wanted to mention that. So you don't always need to seek medical attention, but obviously if you're, you know, if the symptoms persist or if they get, if they're really severe or they're getting, um, you know, if, if they're getting worse, if you're experiencing bloody diarrhea or really, you know, high fever, bloody urine or so signs of severe dehydration, um, then you absolutely should seek uh, medical attention immediately. Okay. Um, all right. So Andrea, you know, fish, we know fish to be healthy, right? Yes. Um, it's recommended as part of a healthy diet. It could actually improve heart health because we know that fish has uh, really great things like omega-3 fatty acids. Um, it's a lean protein. Um, sometimes sushi, you know, it, it can be wrapped in seaweed, which is a good source of iron and calcium and vitamin A. And so it can actually be a really healthy and complete meal. Um, however, there is concern about consuming too much sushi. And this is to do with things like um, mercury, uh, excuse me, mercury poisoning and mercury basically accumulating. And we know that certain fish um, contain higher levels of mercury than others. So um, I want to I I yeah. clarify that this is methylmercury, which is yes. bioaccumulant mercury and not ethyl mercury which which thimerosal is derived of we've talked about that at length but but yeah there are certain types of fish especially the big ocean fish because they are closer to the top of the food chain it bioaccumulates yep. so as they eat smaller fish which have eaten other things that have mercury in the environment methyl mercury is found in soil and rocks and all sorts of sediments um and so you do want to be cognizant you know some people recommend switching up the type of fish you eat and so on but you know just go ahead and um, I think you have some oh, yeah. like ballpark, ballpark <laughs> recommendations. Yes, yes. Sorry, I thought you were mid-thought. Um, but yeah, so it's recommended. And again, this is really, it, it's a loose recommendation. But healthy people can eat two to three sushi rolls per week safely, about 10 to 15 pieces. Um, but exactly as Andrea said, you know, you want to try to limit your consumption of certain varieties that tend to have um, higher levels of mercury and really switch up the type of fish. Um, if this is something that you're concerned about signs of mercury poisoning include things like numbness memory problems muscle weakness tremors and depression um but i think for most people unless you're eating sushi like multiple times every single week this really shouldn't be an issue um but again i mean i i do like to switch up like i'll do tuna then i'll do some salmon then i'll do you know do other do other types and of course if you're concerned there's also cooked sushi rolls and and such but i know you and I well, really like the raw stuff. Well, cooked, cooked would still have mercury. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, the biggest thing here is that, is there such thing as sushi grade or sashimi grade fish? No, not really. Um, are most fish vendors using the FDA guidelines Hopefully, um, but it really varies state by state. So, you know, should you take the risk and eat raw fish? Some of that has to do with how risk averse you are and how, you know, worth the risk or how much you trust where you're getting your fish from. Um, the, the, and, and the only real way to be sure that you eliminate parasites in the flesh is using temperature, the deep freezing method. Um, but bacterial contamination risks are going to exist uh, based mostly on storage and handling of the fish. So, just like with anything you eat, there's always going to be some degree of risk. So it's really um, a personal preference, but just know that those phrases are not something that are actually regulated by law. All right, Andrea. And, and I know we're both going to be getting some sushi later today. Um, with that, take us home. <laughs> All right. So thanks for tuning in today. We hope you learned a thing or two. And if you want more unbiased science, please check out our Substack subscription. It gives you It's for $5 a month. It gives you access to our private Facebook group. You get to submit questions for our monthly Q&As, which you are now recording and posting live to the public. Um, and you're also, of course, supporting our efforts to keep bringing the pod to you. So check it out at theunbysypod.substack.com. And as a reminder, we are um, posting our videos on YouTube now. So even if you're not going to watch the podcast there, please subscribe. It's www.youtube.com at unbiasedsci-pod. And we will, of course, be continuing to provide you science and health-related content on our social channels. So be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at unbiasedsci-pod. Catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science.